Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, may I first of all thank the uh, Center for Asian Legal Studies of the Faculty of Law of the National Law University of Mumbai for inviting me to this colloquium on constitutionalism in South Asia, the crisis, and uh, instable democracies. Not an easy one. My dear friends, in today's world, the trend appears to be that nations were keen to pursue the ideal of a democratic system. So much so that even in authoritarian and socialist communist regimes, there is a strong and regular reference to democracy, although that may be in the context of their own understanding of democracy. On a close examination of the political structures around the world, of course with a view to finding out whether democracy really exists, one would be surprised to find that there are only a few real democracies. Academics have arrived at this conclusion by using the indicator of the holding of regular elections at the end of each term as constitutionally required. Now, when one applies this indicator, it is easily observed that it would be nearly impossible to attribute democratic status to many of the states one would find that the leaders of these nations seek to justify their rule and their existence by propagating mandates and policy statements that are popular with the electorate. Although the benefits of these mandates never ever flow down for the benefit of the electorate. What I am saying in other words is that the holding of elections and the renewal of popular mandates are not necessarily synonymous with democracy. It is only a stepping stone in the process of the establishment of a democratic government. Now, let me, having said that, let me say a word about constitutionalism in its pure sense. Simpliciter. Constitutionalism, my dear friends, is a complex of ideas, attitudes, and patterns of behavior, elaborating the principle that the authority of government derives from and is limited by a body of fundamental law. Now, the concept of constitutionalism is that of a polity governed by or under a constitution that ordains essentially what is known as limited government and the rule of law, as opposed or contrary to arbitrary authoritarian or totalitarian rule. Constitutional government, therefore, should necessarily be democratic government. In other words, constitutionalism is a political philosophy in which functions of government of a state must be in accordance with the provisions of the constitution, meaning thereby the actions of government must reflect constitutionality. As constitutionalism is a political spirit or philosophy, it is therefore not necessary that states who have a constitution must be embodied with the concept of constitutionalism. Now, according to Douglas Greenberg, constitutionalism is a commitment, he says, to limitations on ordinary political power. It revolves around a political process, one that overlaps with democracy in seeking to balance state power and individual and collective rights, that it draws on particular cultural and historical contexts from which it emanates and it resides in public consciousness. My dear friends, political organizations are constitutional to the extent that they contain institutionalized mechanisms of power control for the protection of the interests and liberties of the citizenry including those that may be in the minority. As described by political scientists and the con constitutional scholar, particularly David Fellman, who says that constitutionalism is descriptive of a complicated concept deeply embedded in historical experience, which subjects the officials who exercise governmental power to the limitations of a higher law. Constitutionalism, he says, proclaims 
the desirability of the rule of law as opposed to rule by arbitrary judgment or mere fiat of a public official. Throughout, you will see the literature dealing with modern public law and the foundations of statecraft the central element of the concept of constitutionalism is that it's that in political society government officials and this is important are bound to observe that government officials are not free to do anything they please in any manner they choose they are bound to observe both the limitations on power and the procedures which are set out in the supreme constitutional law of the community now that's important to appreciate. It may therefore be said that the touchstone of constitutionalism is the concept of limited government under a higher law. It is therefore not difficult to appreciate that constitutionalism is an evolving subject. You will appreciate that constitutionalism can only survive if its genesis is from within a framework of a society that recognizes the rule of law. It must necessarily have the features of substantive and procedural legal mechanisms and must ensure the concept of limited government. Although the field of constitutional law has become increasingly comparative in recent times, its geographical focus has remained limited. It is regrettable, I say, that South Asia, notwithstanding that it is home to the world's largest democracy, and other vibrant democracies is one of the most neglected regions in the context of constitutional law. The academic Herschel who wrote on the renaissance of comparative constitutional law, he said the, uh, the says that many scholars and practitioners, including many well-known judges, no longer believe that the task of constitutional law and the appropriate methodology for comparative analysis is essentially domestic in nature. My dear friends, it is believed that the uneven nature of comparative constitutional law lends itself to only modest comparisons that you cannot truly focus on the matter on a global basis with little attention being paid to South Asia. So let's look at it for a moment. India perhaps is the only country that appears in comparative discussions most of the time. The academics seem to suggest that the attention here is also less than one expects to see. And there's a good reason for that. The reason for that is the, that the focus is essentially on matters of peculiar interest to the West, such as the aspect of social rights, their recognition, and how they are decided upon. So notwithstanding the fact that South Asia practices a vibrant constitutionalism, there have been perhaps very few attempts to bring together South Asia's many nations and engage with their constitutional difficulties. The chief reason for this might well be the reason that many issues are connected with the basic constitutional structure which is intricately connected with political ideologies. My dear friends, let me very quickly present to you a bird's eye view of the subject in the context of India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal and Bangladesh, which are nations with varyingly different characteristics in the context of constitutional law. It must be admitted without demur that India has survived as the largest or the world's largest democracy with an active and independent Supreme Court, whilst Pakistan and Sri Lanka have provided reason for perhaps for equal excitement and curiosity of a different kind. Both Pakistan and Sri Lanka today are of geographical or geopolitical importance and the academics seem to express the view, of course as they regularly seem to do to keep the discourse alive, that both nations have a constitutional crisis. Now I don't know whether that's academic overreach but that is what it is. One has seen that in Pakistan there are tensions between the military and civilian rule, which decides the trajectory of the nation's progress. In Sri Lanka, the ethnic crisis is one of the past and appears to be now grappling with constitutional provisions with a view to ensuring true reconciliation. Nepal and Bangladesh are perhaps of lesser interest, 
although Nepal has been in the boiling pot of constitutional making and Bangladesh being under democratic rule for almost 20 years. One would perhaps accept without devaluing the development of constitutional law in all these countries that there is a continuous tension or undercurrent that lies beneath law and politics. It is said that these tectonic plates, these undercurrents nourish constitutional development and the constitutional process. It is not difficult therefore my dear friends to appreciate that what makes the South Asian scenario special is the high degree of tension between substantive formulations of the law and the social and political realities to which the law is required to conform to. It is presumed that the topic unstable constitution whoever who chose it was identified as an expression that describes the character of South Asian constitutionalism which is a phenomenon in which all stakeholders in national politics are genuinely committed to the idea of constitutionalism in the hope of establishing permanent institutions with the capacity to deal with daily governance. Now with all the will in the world what we unfortunately see is something different. What we see unfortunately is that we in South Asia struggle to settle to a stable institutional structure based upon constitutionalism suitable for our own countries. When we look around us what do we see? We see unitary national governments like in Sri Lanka, symmetrical or asymmetrical federalism like in India, confederations, multiculturalism, plurinationalism and in all of this the dominance, the common thread is the dominance by the majority of the minority. Now the commitment from a theoretical point of view that helps us to understand constitutionalism appears to have a turbulent relationship with of course the ground realities that are generated in the politics of these regions. So the term unstable constitutionalism appears to encapsulate the difficulties that are faced by the law between legal norms and socio-political facts as well as the pressing challenges in defining the character of constitutionalism that would help to push a nation from civil life to stability. My dear friends, the academics say that the central concerns of the countries that we just spoke of is not in the debates that interpret the constitutional text or the role of the constitutional courts. It is simply a question of constitutional design and negotiation that would ease the pressure on the systems of government and the risks that it will be exposed to as a result of the domestic factors. It is therefore easy to see that constitutional instability takes place. Look at it carefully. Where there is ethnic conflict, where there is social order and a high degree of diversity in which the stakeholders are supportive of the idea of a single state. It is therefore not possible for us due to the constraints of time to explore the theme of unstable constitutionalism for it involves the studying of the different forms and sources of instability and the reactions and responses to that instability. Constitutional instability you will see therefore uh, and you will appreciate can present itself in numerous ways. Some countries might find it difficult to draft a constitution in the first place. After it is established it is possible that some countries the constitutional framework might be subject to several types of instability. An obvious example would be Nepal in the region. It appears that the failure of the Nepalese constitutional arrangement to give rise and due recognition to the representative arm of the government and to respond to calls for an inclusive democratic state have been the principal characteristics in recent history. Now accepting that the free and fair elections are at the center of any democracy then Bangladesh's experiment in conducting elections seem to be a classic example. Since Bangladesh has moved from military rule few issues have dominated its constitutional discourse as much as the electoral process. My dear friends I might mention in passing that Sri Lanka has managed the tensions between the majority Sinhalese and the minority Tamils and Muslims reasonably well. The failure to address the various issues have led to conflict from time to time. Uh, one conflict raged over 25 years and in 2009 the civil war was brought to an end. 
Several political solutions have been attempted post-war with Tamil political groups agreeing to a federal solution and abandoning their call for secession, although progress on this front could be much better. The federalism debate in Nepal and Sri Lanka has continuously been mooted. It is thought that federalism model can absorb conflict, but there is also a view that it can also make it worse for the reason that ethnicity, whilst having the capacity to empower, can also divide and would give rise to federalism as a stepping stone to secession. You will therefore see that the vast and growing field of constitutional law and politics and its constitutionalism is something that can be subject to in for to in-depth debate. To consider one example is perhaps the recent past has been the horizontal expansion of the jurisdiction of fundamental human rights to private actors and the related issues that this raises for the institutional location of responsibility to the superior courts. It is therefore necessary that we must study South Asia on its own terms to be able to understand it better. It requires that we develop our research agenda around the actual practice of constitutional actors in South Asia. Although one concedes that religion, state relations and socio-economic rights have been important to constitutional practice, they have been not only the central topic of concern. An example that comes quick to my mind is the constitutional policy of official language status that has been the principal driver of shaping the political space in the late colonial and post-colonial periods. You will therefore see that to strategize the study of South Asian constitutionalism that has plagued constitutional stakeholders has opened the door, I say, to an alternative strategy of comparative case studies that opens a wide field beyond the narrow sets of jurisdictions that decide central concerns. I hope that these few ideas that I have thrown open before you would contribute to a successful conclusion of this colloquium, which is more than timely, and would thank the Center again for Asian Legal Studies at the Faculty of Law and its partners for organizing this colloquium, which has drawn focus on a topic of great importance. I thank you.